This is the second episode in a two-part series on using technology in the language classroom. I continue the conversation with Joe Dale, a highly influential and sought-after voice when it comes to all things about technology and language learning. We begin this part of the conversation by diving into using technology for engaging with culture. There are many suggestions that you will want to look into for sure. Everything Joe Dale mentions is linked in the show notes. You can also get all the links in a blog post about this episode. Just go to wlclassroom.com slash EP35 for episode 35. Let's jump back in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. One of the pieces that I wanted to focus on is that idea of the intercultural. Yeah competence. I don't know if, again, that's the language that we use in the US. I don't know if that's the language that you use in the UK. Well, we say intercultural understanding normally, which is probably the same thing. So let's, uh, let's talk about that when it comes to technology. And what are some uh, tools and ways to enhance that intercultural competence or understanding through technology? Okay, so I think an obvious one to say uh, is Edpuzzle in the way that you can uh, take a YouTube clip, which obviously could be about the target culture. Uh, It could be an an authentic video that you found on YouTube and you can just put it into an Edpuzzle uh, exercise that you can add in different uh, uh, questions, interactive questions that come up when the playhead gets to that point. And if they are uh, multiple choice questions, they can be uh, self-marked, which means uh, they save obviously time for the teacher or you can go for short answer questions, which then you then have to then go in and, and uh, mark manually. So I think that's one way of promoting intercultural understanding by asking questions around, uh, let's say, an authentic festival, let's say, in the target country and, and that sort of thing. And then I also think that websites like um, photosforclass.com, which is a directory of uh, royalty-free images, uh, organized by Storyboard That, who also did a webinar for me actually uh, recently. That was also really, really cool. Um, uh, it's on my YouTube channel. But um, Photos of Class, what they've done is they've pulled together uh, different uh, directories such as Pixabay and uh, Flickr and sites like that, all of which have Creative Commons license images, which essentially means royalty free. There's a, Well, there's a lot more to it than that, but you you must always look at the license um, of any image that you want to use in relation to making sure that you don't break copyright. Um, but what I really like about Photos for Class is when you find an image that you like, you can download it, and then um, at the footer, automatically in the footer, it gives the attribution. So it says, you know, the link where it can be found. It says what the the license code is, so you can find exactly what it is that you're allowed and not allowed to do with that image. So once you've found those images, you can then easily, for example, put it into a background in Flipgrid. Um, when I've been demonstrating this in webinars, I've used a Bitmoji character to then do a little animation mm-hmm. um, over the top of, let's say, a beach scene. So I've had myself in a little boat in a, in a, in a suit, which is maybe very British, I don't know, uh, <laughs> paddling across the, the sea uh, in my paddle boat in, within Flipgrid using a photo for class uh, background. So I think whenever we're using multimedia images in different presentations, be it Adobe Spark Video, which is now known as Adobe Power Express, it's changed its name recently, but that's also a really nice presentational tool for um, talking about culture and the fact you can uh, automatically insert um uh, images which are royalty free, which are all about promoting culture. I think that's also really good. And then other ideas uh, through um, songs, uh, websites like Lyrics Training is really good for finding authentic uh, songs as videos and turning them into um, listening comprehension activities. There's a there's a new app which is um, uh, which has not been around that long called Lyrica, which is a little bit similar, which uh, will work on a on a mobile device as opposed to um, on the web. Um, and you've got a number of different um, uh, Spanish, French, German songs. Um, and then you have, you know, the gap fills and what have you and different uh, exercises based on those songs. But the, the, the songs are 
you know, hand-picked, as it were. They've been licensed by the company in order to, for you to to access them. So there's X number, which can be can be accessed for free. And then I think there's a freemium model, if I remember correctly. But that's another nice one for practicing listening um, around authentic content. Are there any particular technology resources that maybe it didn't fall into the category of reading or writing or interpersonal or the uh, whole idea of uh, cultural understanding, intercultural understanding? Is there anything outside of that uh, that you would like to reference and suggest to teachers to use? Uh, okay, so uh, there's lots of other tools I could mention. One I came across recently uh, is called Spinner Wheel, which um, I think is really cool. So a little bit like uh, Wheel of Names, those people that know Wheel of Names, which I've been promoting for ages now, completely free to use. You can use it in a standard way as a random name picker, whereby you add in text into the individual pieces of the pie, as it were, when it spins around. But, but instead of names, you can put in, say, sentence starters. You can also add in images, um, which can be uh, images that you've, you've um, found on the web that you can upload. Obviously, you need to respect copyright while doing that. Mm-hmm. That's another idea. You can add in emojis. I recommend using the emoji keyboard, which is a free Chrome extension, which allows you to have, say, three emojis per section. And then when the um, the item comes up, when, once you spin the wheel, you could then do a speaking activity around the emojis or a writing activity or uh, or that sort of thing. And then Spinner Wheel, which has come out more recently, um, allows you to do the same sort of thing, but you can have up to eight wheels at the same time. So that's really cool. And you can also add in images, but they have to be from Unsplash. You can't add in your own image. And it was actually the the developer, um, Alan Phillips, who got in contact with me on Twitter saying, have you heard of Spinner Wheel, Joe? And I said, no, but I'll check it out right now. And I, <laughs> I sort of fell in love with it overnight because I just... I saw that um, as with, with lots of new technologies that, you know, uh, tick that box, as it were, it was a solution to something which I've been looking around or trying, you know, found a hack for in the past. So with Wheel of Names, I would use a a, um, a Chrome extension uh, tab resize, which allows you to have four windows running at the same time. You'd put one Wheel of Names per window, which would work, but it would take a little bit of time to set up. Whereas with Spinner Wheel, it's so much easier and you can just create as many wheels as you want to. So you could, for example have, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, some subject pronouns in one wheel. You could then have the infinitive in another, in another wheel. You could um, add in emojis as well with spinner wheel as well. And then whatever is spun, you then the student then has to come up with a sentence based on those random prompts, which is, which is really cool. And you can share the link of a spinner wheel so you can bookmark them if you want to, as you can with Wheel of Names. I'd also recommend Flipperty, which is a little bit similar. Flipperty.net is a a free directory of different resources, which are all based on Google Sheets. So you do have to have a Google account to create the Google Sheet. But once you've done that, the students don't need to have any sort of account at all. They just need the link. So uh, Flipperty Randomizer has proved very popular in the way that you can have, uh, let's say, four spinning wheels um, at the same time on the same on the same page, and uh, you can uh, base this on, a, say, a sentence builder, which is very popular in the UK, whereby you have different um, columns in your sentence builder. You can take one item from each column to make your sentence. And um, I've seen lots of language teachers in the MFL Twitter RT who've used Flipperty Randomizer, uh, and one uh, teacher, Mike Elliott, who's the head of the department in the south of England, recommended that you use the screen recording feature in Flipgrid uh, as a homework task for the students to spin the wheel, say, 10 times, and then they have to translate the uh, results as well as pronou- they pronounce it first. So it might be, I don't know, my mum uh, is quite uh, shy, for example. Uh, uh, the person, w- the child would then pronounce that in the target language and then translate it into English. But recording themselves, see another example of a multimodal approach, recording themselves and then sharing that video directly within Flipgrid. So it's all within a moderated private environment. Um, and for those people that say, well, what do you do if this ch- the child doesn't have the internet at home? You could maybe offer them the opportunity of coming at lunchtime to do the homework then, or, or that sort of that sort of thing. So, those are a few ideas. There are lots of other 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 tools out there, but um, I think that that's maybe enough for for now. Right. This is a a question that comes up a lot. Actually, it comes up for me a lot, and I hear it with other teachers with legacy traditional language teaching going back 25, 30 years. A lot of the worksheet activities that were happening. So with a lot of new technology, some of it feels like we have reverted to that a little bit, to those worksheets. We just do it in a digital way. And so it feels like it's new and progressive, 
but it's actually regressing to old teaching styles that looks like it's in a shiny new package. So do you have any sort of ad- advice for us teachers as we are taking on new technology that we stay progressive with our language teaching and not just use it to do something that is sort of outdated. Yeah. So in relation to that, I think um, that if you look at the summer model, um, which was the work of Dr. Ruben Quintedura, I find that it's very useful as a way, as a sort of a framework to help you always consider when you're using technology about what you're doing exactly. So what you've just mentioned about, let's say, doing an activity, which is essentially the same as a traditional activity, it would be on the first level, as it were, the substitution level, whereby there's no there's no difference between the two activities. So instead, so for example, um, asking the students to uh, write a few paragraphs in their exercise book as opposed to writing them up in the Google Doc, there's no sort of functional change. Whereas if they were to say go to the next level, which would be augmentation, they would then maybe collaborate on that document with somebody else. So they could be working on the same document. Two people could be working on the same document. Therefore, you're adding. A functional change and then it goes up to um, the next one is modification whereby you have to basically redesign the task by using um, different types of, uh, of technology up to redefinition when you are making an activity which would be impossible without the use of technology which could be for example a, an interactive cartoon which you maybe are sharing with a, a partner school let's say that sort of that sort of thing uh, using uh, say a, a collaborative thing link but to answer your question, I think that we must always, always look at, whenever we're using technology, always be looking at the pedagogy behind it, uh, how to make it as effective as possible, how to make it pers- purposeful. So if it, if we feel that it's not enhancing the learning, then we could obviously say, well, why are we doing this? Now, I would say in relation to, say, I don't know, like a gapful activity, based on my own personal experience when I was making lots and lots of different hot potato activities to go back to what I was saying right at the beginning when I was really inspired. I made lots and lots of hot potato activities around grammar. So I would ask the students to do traditional 10 sentences with examples in the perfect tense, let's say. Uh, So that would be their homework. I would then take those answers that would normally referring to like uh, the name of the cinema in the local area or the name of the park. So instead of just having the verb, you'd have like the whole sentence and it would refer to local things, which is fantastic. And then I would just take all those um, different sentences and then digitize them and make them into hot potato activities. And as a result of that, and making them into different cycles, which is what you can do with hot potatoes, I would then take the students into the the computer room and some of them were able to do between 10 and 15 exercises and each exercise was 10 sentences each. And what they had to do is they had to go through and they had to conjugate the verb. Now, if they were to do the same thing on paper, I think there's no way that the students would do the same number of activities in the same time. What's what's being added to it, it which is quite a dry grammatical focus uh, type of activity, by using the technology, it, it, it is enhancing it because they're doing a lot more in the time and they're getting immediate feedback, which is pressing them on and it's creating new neural pathways in their brain and, and you know solidifying the patterns that they're learning about, depending on what the grammar might be. So I think that even though something might be quite dry on paper, when you digitize it, it might be a similar sort of, you know, traditional activity as it were, but it's digitized. But what it's what you're gaining, the affordances you're getting from that is the fact that it can be done normally, you know, more quickly. Uh, the student gets the buzz of getting immediate feedback. And as people like, you know, Dylan William talk about the importance of having feedback on point in real time feedback as, as quickly as you possibly can get it. Technology, I think, lends itself brilliantly to that. And also the idea is, behind you know retrieval practice and that pull and pull between the working memory and the long-term memory i think that by doing more activities in the same amount of time will really help to embed the 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 core ideas around say grammar into the students long-term memories and i think that's that's a win-win it might be quite traditional and and dry but using the technology can can bring it to life and then obviously with the the speaking work the fact you can record yourself as many times as you need to, the fact you can listen back to the, the content, it doesn't just go off into the ether. If you're going to edit the content, that, that really helps again to keep it in your head. So if you're going to make a, some sort of podcast or maybe record yourself using a tool like Vocaroo or you're going to give um, some audio feedback to a peer, let's say, I think that all really helps with taking the, taking the spoken word, having it as evidence, uh, being able to refer back to it to show progression over time. I think the technology lends itself, you know, really well to it. I, and I think that the technology has got better and better and better. But the key traditional pillars of 
of education that we talked about have stayed the same, which does, which makes sense, I think. So there are always teachers that are hearing things for the first time, new things, trying out new things. And I love the fact that they're listening to us right now, which means that they're open, <laughs> you know, to trying out something new. So uh, you work a lot with, with teachers, different mediums, whether in person and webinars and everything. And I'm sure you have some hesitation from teachers sometimes, right? Um, it's something new. So for those teachers that may not be totally comfortable with taking this leap into using technology, how do you help them over that hurdle to start integrating technology? Okay, so I think confidence is the key here. And whenever I'm doing a face-to-face training session or a webinar, I always say at the end, particularly if it's been, I don't know, say an hour or a couple of hours or, or longer, I always say, you know, just just pick one idea or two ideas uh, that we've covered and try that out. What you, you know, what wouldn't be good is if you try and do everything at once because probably you'll fall over, you'll feel overwhelmed. The students won't, you know, get the most out of it because uh, maybe you're, you're feeling, you know, they can pick up on your, your lack of confidence. Just choose one thing, have a play with it, maybe try it out on a friend. Um, and then go from there rather than trying everything at the same time. I'd also really, really recommend um, going onto my YouTube channel with all those tilt webinars, um, because as I said, there are 140 of them. There are teachers from literally all over the world who are presented completely for free. I work for free on doing that because morally it just felt the right thing to do and to help other people. And you've got, you know, fantastic practicing teachers who are sharing ideas that work in their classroom during the pandemic, be it a remote teaching context, a hybrid teaching context, face-to-face context, everything in, uh, you know, in between, and you will, you will pick up some fantastic ideas. And what's great also about a YouTube clip is you have the pause button. So you can just pause it, you can go back, you can watch it again. You can have, uh, if you're lucky enough to have two screens, um, you can, uh, you can you know, have a play on the second screen while watching the video. Um, I think that's really what I would recommend. That's one reason why at the start of the pandemic, I thought it would be a really good idea to try and, if you like, draw on all my contacts I've been making over many, many years, um, having traveled here and everywhere and being on Twitter, to try and invite them to uh, take part for in tilt webinars for the Association for Language Learning so that they, um, you know, their uh, profile could be maybe raised uh, in the UK if they're from the States or from further afield, etc. Um, and that there would be really useful practical tips because I really felt for teachers at the start of the pandemic and um, I, I thought, well, how can I help? And fortunately, because I have the skill set around digital technologies, et cetera, I thought, well, the best thing to do is to do all these webinars as well as, you know, obviously make money through, make, through doing webinars as well. And, you know, this is not a sob story. I, I'm doing absolutely fine. <laughs> but um, but uh, I thought that was the best that was the best thing to do. So um, don't try everything at once. Just choose one thing. Try it out with a friend. Try it out with a nice class, let's say. Uh, and listen to what they say. If they like it, do more of it. If they don't like it, try something else. Um, but don't um, don't just use technology. Don't just tick the technology box by playing games. And that's mm-hmm. not to diss teachers, because obviously everyone, as a result of the pandemic, you know, has had to do emergency remote teaching. It's n- it's not just you know on a Friday afternoon ticking the the ICT box by playing a game. It's all about learning how to present content, how to give feedback, and all those other things. I can remember right at the start, people saying. Um, how do I do speaking practice? So I would then recommend Quicker and Flipgrid. Um, how do I do a screencast? You know, telling people how to re- recording audio in their PowerPoint and export it as a video and really trying to help people and hold people's hands virtually speaking. And my DMs were open and people were contacting me all the time. And there were all these Facebook groups as well. Uh, people were setting up and getting thousands of members uh, just talking about technology and pedagogy. It was wonderful, but a bit overwhelming even for me as well. Thank you. There are definitely teachers that need to be hearing that advice. So thank you for sharing that with us. So I'm interested to know where you continue to get inspired from. Like, where what are you looking to? You've mentioned a bunch of people already, but is there anyone else or anywhere else where you just continue to draw your inspiration from? Uh, well, I uh, use the hashtags, um, mm-hmm. MFL Twitterati. I use Langchat. Um, I create different lists of people who I... Uh, find interesting so the the mfl twitter's list which is on my profile on uh, uh, on my twitter account that's sort of like the uh, if you like the virtual place to go to if you're interested in finding out about the mfl twitter rt so yes you can follow the hashtag but if you subscribe to the the list and is mfl twitterers then there's over 2200 subscribers i think 
that's the great a great place to uh, find out what's going on. I listen to podcasts all the time. I really love my Overcast um, app uh, on iOS mm-hmm. and um, uh, Pocket Cast on Android. Um, depending on which device I'm on, uh, I'm listening to lots of bits of audio. I'm really, really into Twitter spaces at the moment. I think that's going to be a great idea for the MFL Twitterati to come together and to, mm-hmm. to chat, but we can actually hear each other's voices. So I've been doing lots of research around uh, Twitter spaces, and I've been listening to a, um, a podcast called All Things Audio, which um, was created by Madeline Sklar from the States and um, Suze Cooper from uh, the UK, and they talk about... Uh, social audio such as Twitter Spaces and and Clubhouse, but um, I'm really excited about the idea of uh, talking about Twitter Spaces in the future. Do it, running some Twitter Spaces, my my idea is to call it Ask Joe Dale. So I'll have mm-hmm. a Google form uh, for you know uh, running for say a week or two weeks, and then people will ask me questions like a clinic idea, and then I'll try my best to answer them, but also ask the people who've asked the questions to join us as well. Maybe have like a guest panel uh, for people who are using technology regularly in their own context and then say, well, what would you say to, you know, I'm, I'll answer the question first, but then put, put the, that question to somebody else in the uh, in the room. That's that's the idea. But I'm a little bit busy at the moment. So um, I think um, it's, we're not quite ready to launch yet, but hopefully soon. We'll be looking forward to that. I'm uh, I'm just discovering uh, those new Twitter features as well. Um, I think that's the first time we connected was in Liam Printer's Twitter Twitter space. Uh, so now this is the the point in our conversation where I like to do what I call pulling the teacher curtain aside a little bit and to get to know Joe a little more. Um, and it's funny, these are the things that sometimes people will come up to at a conference or something and they'll be like, oh, I heard that you and it's because of the are either or. <laughs> so the first one, I mean, you're you're a technology guy. So when it comes to email, are you the type that you'll read an email on your phone and you'll answer it right there on your phone? Or do you wait till you're back at your desktop or laptop to answer the email? Good question. What I normally do, if I'm on my phone or I'm on my iPad, I use voice dictation a lot. Mm-hmm. So I find that's a great way of saving time. So I'll dictate my uh, answer to the email as opposed to writing it. If I'm writing a longer answer when I've got to really think about it, I'll do that on my on my desktop or on my Mac uh, normally. Yeah, if it's a quick and easy one, I'll use voice dictation because it's just a great way of you know saving your hands for a bit. But mm-hmm. um, if I really need to think about it or put in links and things like that, I know I could do that on the uh, yeah. on the iPad on my phone. I just prefer to um, to do it uh, using my my desktop. Yeah, yeah. I I get myself into a lot of trouble with that whole concept because I'm not great at answering right on my phone. And so I always say, oh, I'll answer when I get back to my computer. And then I never answer it. And then I realize three days later, oh, and I remember reading that and I meant to. And so when I tell people, I'm so sorry, I meant to answer it two days ago, I actually did. Like I'm the person who means that when they say it. Well, I, I tend to, to flag my I tend to flag my emails and then um, uh, go back and then yeah. see the ones that I flagged, as it were. But the problem can be that you just flag so many emails and it's like it's just too long a list. But another another thing that I do is um, if I come across an interesting site, um, mm-hmm. I will either bookmark it in Wakelet or sometimes I'll send myself an email and then literally. Uh, I'll be sending it on my say my desktop, and then my iPad. I'll get a notification, and I think to myself, "Oh, I've got an email." And I look at it, and I realize actually it's just me <laughs> sending me the <laughs> the link. If that I had a penny for every time I, <laughs> I did that, I'd probably have at least or oh, seventy three <laughs> pence by now, I reckon. So, going a little bit more on uh, technology, there's so much online ordering of everything now. Uh, do you need to see something in person before you purchase it, or are you okay with just buying it online? Uh, it depends what it is. If it's clothes. Definitely, I want to to see it if I can. Make sure it fits okay, you know, like jeans or shoes or or that sort of thing. Um, uh, if it's uh, records or things like that. that said, I used to love going to the record shop um, where I live, but unfortunately, that's now closed down, which is really annoying. But um, but yeah, if it's um, uh, it, it depends. If it's clothes or it's uh, or food or things like that, I'd much prefer to mm-hmm. sort of see it in the flesh, as it were. Okay, this this last one's a little more poetic and less technology. Uh, so are you more of the type to get up early for the sunrise or to go out and see the sunset at the end of the day? That's a good question. Um, 
my, my wife likes to get up in the morning and take our son to see the sunrise, literally. I, I prefer to stay in bed and not get up at five o'clock in the morning, whatever it might be. I do like going for lots of walks. I love going for walks, uh, not necessarily to see the sunset, but to just be outside in nature, particularly during the pandemic, to clear my head, to, to listen to a podcast like All Things Audio. That's what literally what I was doing this afternoon. Uh, I think that, um, you know, going for a walk, just clearing your head, uh, thinking about things is a great a great thing to do. I'd really encourage people to find the time. So I guess the the question, yeah, the, the question I guess would be then not necessarily involving the sun rising and setting, but when you're doing your thought collection and you're thinking and you're listening, is that a morning thing or an afternoon evening thing for you? I think I work best in the morning. I think what I tend to do is, um, you know, I'll uh, go through my daily routine, drop my son off, come back. Um, that'll be, say, nine o'clock. And then I will then uh, do my, my morning's work, um, have my lunch, uh, do a couple of hours, go and pick my son up again, come back, bath time. And then in the evening, normally it's a webinar or it might be a podcast interview, as in this evening. Um, mm-hmm. So I try to get as much work done as possible. Uh, in the morning when my when I am uh, less tired. Um, that said, if I've got a deadline and I'm doing a presentation, I've got to tweak something or I've been busy, then it might be that I'm working late on that or it can easily be that um, I'm doing a bit of research or as my wife would say, playing. Um, and I, uh, you know, I'm up late uh, looking for uh, whatever it might be, the, the perfect image or or I'm doing my research on, you know, the latest microphone or whatever it might be. Once once I get into something, nothing stops me really. I just need to find out the answer to whatever the question might be, be it working out for myself, which is what I normally do, or asking asking my community for help if need be. There may be some folks out there that want to talk to you about technology, and there might be some folks out there who want to talk to you about whether or not you should buy your clothing online. <laughs> so <laughs> so how, how should we all be getting in touch with you and continuing our conversations with okay, you? Okay, well, first of all, I would love to hear from people. Uh, I always love to connect with language teachers, particularly language teachers interested in technology because uh, that's my big thing. Um, so in relation to getting in contact, uh, my Twitter account is probably the best way. Um, I'm at Joe Dale on Twitter. I've got now over 33,000 followers on Twitter because I've been on Twitter for over 14 years, nearly 15 years. Um, that would be a great place. Um, if you go to my bio on, on Twitter, um, you'll see I've got a pinned tweet, uh, which is actually a thread of about, I think, eight different um tweets there and it sort of goes to my bio um it has a list of 18 example sessions which i put together based on sort of themes of the pandemic around asynchronous teaching and synchronous teaching and working in the google environment and microsoft environment and and what have you so if people wanted to have a look at that and if there was anything that jumped at them and they they thought they'd like to invite me to do a webinar either for their school or for the local district or they're part of a language association um, and they'd like me to to speak at that. I mean, I've spoken, uh, one of the things I've tried to do in the pandemic is, is speak at many virtual conferences, which I wouldn't necessarily have been able to afford to have gone to face to face, even though I have been to the States quite a few times, but I've spoken at a number of different um, uh, ones in the States, such as Flava and Skolt and IALT and, and places like that. So if people like what they're hearing and they think, oh, that Joe Daly knows this, he knows a few things about technology, feel free to invite me to uh, to keynote or to do a workshop at your your conference or if you need some support in relation to uh, webinars then uh, I'm here to help uh, and I'd love to do so as we are signing off here I like always to leave our listeners with something actionable that they can do in their classroom so can you leave us with a, an actionable piece of advice about technology in our language classrooms uh, I would say go to the go to my YouTube channel have a look at the Tilt webinars. There's 140 there. Choose one that you like that jumps at you, that appeals to you, and try out one idea from that particular webinar. And let me know how you got on on Twitter. I would love to hear from you. That That's my actionable point for today. I've really appreciated spending this time with you and learning how some of our language teaching vocabulary <laughs> from uh, the US and the UK can differ a little bit, but underneath it all, we're, we're all doing the same work and working together. And I really appreciate all the insights and the time 
tons of resources that you recommended to us. So thank you for all of that and for your time with us today. Thank you so much, Joshua. It's been a real pleasure. And I really hope that your listeners um, uh, can find something useful in what I've said. And if there's anything people are not sure about, just get in touch. I'm more than happy to uh, to clarify anything that I've said uh, in, the, in the session. And uh, it's been great to be in your podcast. And I really hope that uh, it carries on to be even better than it is already. Lots more suggestions from Joe Dale about using technology in the language classroom. Be sure to check out the episode blog post for all the links at wlclassroom.com slash ep35. Also, be sure to check out the show notes to connect with Joe and get all the links mentioned there as well. You'll also see the link for Talking Points, my weekly email newsletter with tips and resources for language teaching. There are also links to get in touch with me if you'd like to work together, either in person in your school or remotely. Talk to you soon. Bye for now. You've been listening to the World Language Classroom Podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss a single episode. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WL Classroom. You can also see over 250 blog posts about language teaching at, you guessed it, wlclassroom.com.